Thanks everybody for joining. So this is the setup meeting for the RASPA study, which is the randomised trial of suction for primary pneumothorax early resolution. So we're going to go through quite a bit of detail in here. I'm going to skim over some of the, the detail, but we really want this to be a document that you can come back to and and refresh yourself if you've got any queries as well. So there's lots of information in here, not all of which I'll, I'll go through in great detail today, but I'll go through most about what, why we're doing the study, the, the trial summary, the randomization and, and consent process. So let's get started. Um, very basically, primary pneumothorax is essentially air around the lung between the lung and the chest wall. It often happens in otherwise fit young patients that without no lung disease that we call primary spontaneous pneumothorax and often results in around 3,000 emissions per year. Treatment can involve ambulatory care or, or, or conservative management, but often ends up uh, with a chest drain. And if you have a chest drain, you get to stay in hospital often between four and eight days. What we don't know is whether providing suction to those chest drains speeds up the drainage of air and potentially allows that patient to get home earlier. At the moment, the suction is used fairly randomly uh, depending on, on, on each individual physician's preference. And say so we did a survey a few years ago now and found marked variation in the use of thoracic suction. There's really not strong evidence to know whether it works or not, so it's not recommended uh, in the guideline, the BTS guidelines, whereas the NICE guidelines suggest that we could use the Topaz suction devices. So there's a bit of con conflict there. So we've got potential to improve patient outcomes here in terms of treatment duration, reduced hospital stay and, and fewer interventions. And when we talk to patients about this, that this is exactly in line with what they would like from, from their, from their um, treatment. So what we're going to do is a multi-centre open labour randomised control trial with an internal pilot over the first 12 months to make sure that this is, is feasible and we're able to recruit and open centres. And we're testing whether the suction is superior to standard care in terms of total treatment duration, as in providing suction does it reduce the, the treatment duration. So to prove that we need 450 patients, we're looking to set up 36 sites in total. And as I say the first 12 months is the, first, the pilot phase followed by a further 23 months if we're getting up to scratch. We, in terms of follow up, patients can follow up at two weeks after their completion of treatment and then one and six months after their, uh, from the date of randomization. And this is, this is our uh, criteria for going ahead from the pilot phase to the main phase in terms of numbers of centres open, number of patients randomised per centre per month and how good we are at collecting and and documenting the data so that's where we're going to be what we're going to be assessed at uh, in probably in july time so primary outcome as i mentioned is is to look to see whether the, the use of suction is superior to standard care in terms of the total treatment duration which is the time from randomization to removal of the chest drain and this gets documented on the completion of treatment form and we're defining it as when the chest drain gets removed we're collecting lots of other data uh, as well, uh, including things like surgical uh, referral rates, total length of stay of the first 30 days so to include any readmissions, pain and breathlessness scores and rates of recurrence. And those are going to be captured on the CRFs, both at base, baseline completion and treatment and the follow up uh, points as well. We want to check whether this is cost effective. So we're looking at incremental cost per quality adjusted life year and to, to look at any problems or, or risk of use of the suction as well. We know in, in, in theory that the, the uh, use of suction may improve the uh, resolution rate of pneumothorax, but it may also cause complications such as pain and breathlessness or other complications. So we're capturing all of those on the completion of treatment forms. So we wanted to be as inclusive as we can be. So anybody with a suspected primary spontaneous pneumothorax, either first or recurrent episodes can be enrolled. And anyone between 16 and 50 years old can be uh, can be enrolled uh, as consistent with uh, with other studies. The patient needs to have a pneumothorax, a pneumothorax which has a chest drain in, and ideally within 24 hours of the drain insertion, but could be up to 72 hours. What we what we don't want is the patient necessarily to be randomised immediately, because it, we know that there will be a portion of patients that do resolve within the first few hours. So really, we want the patient to be perhaps on the ward the day after they get admitted with the drain, they've got an ongoing bubbling drain. 
uh, a non-resolving pneumothorax that the patients that we want. And obviously they have to have be willing to consent. They need to have access to some form of electronic device or a phone or a tablet to fill in the, the pain and breathlessness questionnaires because they're going to be emailed a link. So this is the first point we'll mention it, but all of our data collection is all electronic. So there's no paper forms anywhere. So patients get a link to their pain and breathlessness scores. So we want to exclude patients with known or suspected lung disease, such as known CBD or, or lung cancer or interstitial lung disease. The fact that you might find a few blebs or bulla on a CT scan is quite common in patients with primary mm -hmm. thorax, so that wouldn't exclude the patient per se. Um, but if there's anything, any other reason you think they shouldn't be in, then, then please don't include them. Asthma is not an, an exclusion criteria if their asthma is well controlled or, or childhood asthma they've grown out of. But if they're on, uh, if they've ever been admitted with exacerbation of asthma, then they shouldn't be in. So we want to kind of keep it quite straightforward. So you screen anybody with a primary, anyone with this primary pneumothorax um, onto a screening log and then roll those patients that have still got a pneumothorax with a chest drain in place at about, say, about day one to within 24 hours. They get randomised to the standard care without suction or the intervention arm, which is providing suction via digital device. And so each of the, the uh, arms effectively have the same review process. So we review daily, which usually involves a chest X-ray and, and resolution assessment to see whether the drain has stopped bubbling. And in the standard care arm, this gets just happens. Uh, when well, all the arms we see, if, it, if that's resolved, then you can remove the chest drain, um, repeat, make sure that the, they've, they're comfortable, and then discharge them home with no recurrence. If it's not resolved, then you essentially feed back and resolve, uh, continue to review each day. We've got some criteria to help uh, make it objective about chest drain removal. So if the lung has successfully re-expanded on chest X-ray and the drain is, is patent and there's no bubbling, if you're looking at the standard care arm and there's, there's less than 20 mils of air leak for more than four hours on a digital suction device, we say that that's resolved and you can take the drain out. If the patient has still got an unresolved pneumothorax at day four, that'll be the time point when we would suggest referring on for surgery. They don't need to have surgery necessarily that day, but that's the time point where we'd not normally refer them for surgery. If they do end up going for surgery, then the end of their surgical treatment would be their completion of treatment form rather than the end of their initial stay. But if they resolve their pneumothorax before they have surgery, then that can get completed from there. I say the follow up is at 14 days post discharge and uh, at one six months, which can be over the phone. So the only thing that we get is paper here is the consent form. So we can you can print out the PISs to get the information leaflets to give to patients and they need a signed copy of the consent form that can be score, stored or scanned into the patient notes and one to the site file and one to the patient. And we'll, we'll go through online how to do that process online to check their eligibility criteria. Screening, I think, is really important. We need to make sure that we're not missing anybody and also to have an idea of how many patients with pneumothorax are coming through that we're are not suitable for a randomization. So we we'd have an chronic screening log of all the patients with a, a primary pneumothorax listing why or they were or weren't uh, randomized and we'd ask them to send them to us each month. Um, they can, that can be added on to a continuous basis, so we don't need a separate screening form for each month. You can, it can be cumulative. So it looks something like this. So you can have the participants initials there when you screen them, whether they had a PIS or not, whether they're eligible. If they weren't eligible, why, why not? Um, and if, or if they were eligible and, and were, weren't randomised, then, then why not? Um, just to give us a, a flavour for what, what patients are coming through, making sure we're recognising the primary pneumothoraces and, and identifying them when we can. So randomisation, this, this bit is important. So the, this is the format of the trial number. So RAS for RASPA is the first bit, and then DASH, then a, a 01 or, or 0203. That will be your two-digit site number. And then the 001 will be the cumulative number of patients recruited at that site. And we'll show you in a second, but on the REDCap database, you'll need to enter that uh, trial number yourself when you're randomising your next patient to then that feed through to get them that randomised and it needs to be in the correct format. So we'll talk you through that in a minute. And when we get green lighted, we'll give you the two digit site number to make that easier for you.
So there's a certain number of things that need to be signed off to allow us to uh, sign off on the on the red cap screening form and eligibility CRF to allow you to randomize. And again, Lindsay will talk you through this in a second. But one of the key things that we have an email address because the patient is going to get emailed the link for their pain and breathlessness scores. We're minimizing by size of, of the pneumothorax so that we ask you to estimate the size of the pneumothorax on chest X-ray. Which is greater or less than. Uh, four centimeters the level of the hilum and the date of the drain insertion. So often if the randomization link doesn't work, it's, it might well be because the size of the pneumothorax is missing from the previous form or the trial number is not in the right format. It needs to be this this format here. Or the, the, that participant number has already, new, already been used and need to go to the next one. So this is just a quick schematic of, of what we're capturing at each time point. So we have a an enrollment CRF, which captures most of the pe patient's medical history and demographics and then and then randomize them. Daily review includes pain and breathlessness scores that the patient needs to fill in, uh, an assessment of any adverse events, um, and documenting whether the drain removal has been uh, criteria has been met. Then it's completion of treatment uh, form. It captures all of the plural procedures that they've had and any other complications. And then the follow ups are essentially the same at 14 days from completion of treatment and then one month and six months, which is again. Uh, a link gets sent to them about pain and breathlessness scores and their health status. And mostly what we're going to be asking them about is the recurrence of pneumothorax and any repeat admissions to hospital. So if the patient gets randomised to usual care, they shouldn't have suction as a standard, but we're aware that emergency use of suction does is required sometimes. So if there's a very large air leak, that means that pneumothorax is getting bigger despite a, uh, the drain being patent or the subcutaneous emphysema, or if the, your, your surgeons request it to be uh, placed before they go for surgery, then we can use emergency suction even in the standard care arm. That just needs to be documented on the form. So we're not saying in the usual care arm that we could never use suction. We're just not routinely using it early that we are in, this, in the invent, intervention arm. As I mentioned, the patient questionnaires, which are the pain and breathlessness scores, get automatically sent to the patient at certain time points. So we need to make sure the email address is correct and it's working. So when the patient when the patient gets uh, enrolled and and complete the first uh, questionnaire that automatically gets sent and then that triggers the next four rent, uh, uh, timings for the next four questionnaires. So they get sent at 10 a.m. on the subsequent days. The completion of treatment form is another trigger point for when they get their completion of treatment form safe. So please try and complete the completion of treatment form on the day they they get uh, go home so they can get their email link sent directly to them. Now they do expire because we want to capture what their pain and breathlessness score is on that day. If they don't do it that day, then it will expire and they'll have to leave that one and do the next day. So you can't add them retrospectively. So the suction devices we're using for the intervention arm, either the rocket PSUs, which we can provide for you if you don't have them already, or the Topaz devices if, if you have those already. So do use whatever you're using at the moment. And if you haven't got any, then rocket can are supporting the study, but providing two suction devices as a loan to you to use as part of the study. Um, and as I say, if you're not using them already, then rocket can get your team trained up as to how to do it. So just uh, contact us about that. If the patient decides they don't want to continue with the study, they can withdraw from the from the process. Obviously, we don't really want to do that because we want to capture as much data as possible. But if they insist, we can give them two options. One is to withdraw from any active follow up, but we can still use their data we've collected so far and still look at their patient records to see if they have another admission later. And that's, that's our ideal one. Or they can withdraw from the study. and We can't obtain any further data. So if, if they do really want to withdraw, we try and go get them to go for option one where we can still collect routinely collected hospital data at their follow up time points, but not necessarily phone them. And, and that just needs to be documented on the CRF. Safety reporting, we're, we're capturing uh, lots of adverse events and essentially that time period is any time from randomization to the time of their discharge from hospital. We're not expecting any adverse events related to the suction after the, the drain has been removed. So these are the foreseeable events that we're capturing 
as part of the daily CRFs to the, that are the key things that you can mention. So these are things that we kind of ex expect that do happen sometimes. So pain, small bleeding or subcutaneous emphysema, pleural infection or the drain pool, uh, falling out, ongoing pneumothorax or worsening of the pneumothorax if we thought it fully resolved, and re-expansion pulmonary edema. Um, any other events that occur that aren't listed there need to be recorded on adverse event form. And there's also one on REDCAP as well. Any serious adverse events need to be reported to us quickly uh, as, per, as per standard. So email us directly as soon as you become aware of those and we can have a, and we've got independent medical reviewers to review those for you. Any uh, serious breaches or protocol deviations, just let us know and, and we can, we can uh, act on those as, as required. All of the parties, all the people that are, are involved in getting participants in and, and, and entering data need to be on the delegation log. So please make sure those are up to date and the training logs are signed off as well by the PI. We use the same delegation log for those patients who are going to be randomising as well. And because red, we're using the red cap with the inbuilt link to the randomization software, we need to know on the delegation log who needs access to be able to randomise or not and who's going to be entering data onto the database but not ran randomising because they have a different level of access. So please, please do make that clear. We haven't got many trial specific procedures because most of this is fairly standard care, but we, we state that with the thoracic suction arm that we're incrementing the suction up slowly over every, every two or three hours, up initially from minus one kilopascals up to two kilopascals slowly. And if the patient develops any adverse events, then you can bring it down again. Uh, we just need to document what level of suction they're on each day in the standard care in the suction arm. We ideally want the data entered uh, directly as possible on, onto the database, so we're not providing paper CRFs that need to be stored uh, securely. Otherwise, it all should be entered uh, directly. If it's not possible, then, for example, if it's over, over a weekend, um, then please just make sure that the site team who are looking after the patient clinically capture enough in the patient clinical notes that we can then add it in on the, on the days uh, when you come back to work. So we're not going to be uh, monitoring directly on the sites in terms of the what data gets entered and the randomization process, but we'll do some central monitoring. And if we feel there's an issue with um, some data entry or recruitment, we can obviously in contact all the sites on an individual basis. We're pleased that we're part of the associate PI scheme, which is essentially a six month in work kind of mentoring opportunity for, for registrars who are on site to get involved with research. I think this is a really good way to get some of the junior registrars up and interested in research. So let us know if you're interested and we can help get you signed up for that. So these are the key contacts. Uh, that's me at the top, Rob Halifax and Beanish is the trial coordinator. Um, Kajani you saw earlier was a trial assistant and Ellie is the trial manager. Um, but do contact us on any of the, these phone numbers. Yes, yeah, so this is an overview of all your participants on the trial. So you can see the events such as screening contact details and then the CRFs underneath, such as eligibility. If I click on the patient trial number, that opens the record homepage for that participant where you can see the data matrix. So we have the events along the top, screening contact details, baseline, etc. And then the data collection instruments CRFs or forms down the left hand side. So the first form to fill out is the eligibility form in the screening event. If I open that up, you can see it's a series of yes, no questions for the inclusion and the exclusion criteria. The next form to fill out is the contact details. This has the email address for the participant, and that's important because the surveys are emailed to the participant with a link for the participant to su submit those on REDCap. And the first surveys are sent at baseline immediately on randomization. You then got the enrollment CRF in the baseline event. Two key fields here are the size of pneumothorax, because you can't randomise a participant unless that field has data. 
and also the date of chest drain insertion, which ideally should be filled out because it's copied to the randomization CRF. You've then got the auto-randomized CRF. So this has a link to Sortition, the randomization software. So you just click on the link and then Sortition randomizes the participant. And then the randomization data are backfilled into REDCap. So I can show you that on the randomization CRF. Here we've got key randomization data, such as the treatment arm. And the system will automatically mark this CRF complete once the participant is randomized. If you find that the auto randomize link isn't working, that might be because there's no size of pneumothorax on the enrollment CRF, or it could be that the patient trial number isn't in the right format. So the format is RAS for RASPA and then a dash and then a two digit site number. So here is site 99 and then a dash and then a three digit participant number. So it starts at 001 and then increments by one each time. So this is the second participant at site 99. There's then a baseline CRF where you can enter data such as clinical observations and analgesia use. And then there are the two surveys that the participant submits via the link to REDCap. So that's the EQ5D and the VAS. The next event is the daily review to discharge. There are four daily review CRFs and also four VAS day surveys. So each of the VAS surveys is sent at 10 a.m. on that day. And if the participant has already completed treatment and been discharged at day two to four, it can still mark the CRF complete. So there's a question here, has the patient already been discharged, brackets completed treatment? And if that's true, you just put yes and you can mark the CRF complete. If it's no, then the remainder of the CRF fields then appear. There's then the completion of treatment CRF. And two key fields here are the date of completion of treatment, which is the removal of chest drain. So as soon as a date is saved here, the completion of treatment surveys are sent. Another key field is the date of discharge from hospital. So that triggers the 14 day follow up survey and that's sent 14 days from the date of discharge. So then you've got the day 14 follow up event with a day 14 follow up CRF and just a VAS survey this time, not an EQ5D. You've then got the day 30 follow up and that's 30 days after randomization. So that's a day 30 follow up CRF where you can enter details such as pneumothorax recurrence and healthcare contacts. And you've also got an EQ5D and a VAS for day 30. And similarly, you've got a month six follow up, which is six months post randomization. There's then a CONMEDS event where you can add concomitant medications for the participant. So this is a repeating form, so you can add a new instance for each new medication. There's then the adverse events event. And these are also repeating forms. So that has an AE form, an SAE report form, and an SAE review form. And finally, you've got a withdrawal event with a withdrawal form where you can enter details on why the participant withdrew or the reason for withdrawal and the level of consent withdrawal. <laughs> 